All right. We will get going here. So, hey, um, again, yeah, thanks everybody for joining our, our webinar, JS Tap Weaponizing JavaScript for Red Teamers. It's going to be presented by Drew Kirkpatrick from our software security team. Um, my name's my name's Chris Besh. I'm the vice president of sales and marketing here at Trusted Sec. So before we get started here, just some you know some housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar. Um, we will have on our YouTube channel. We will put it at there afterwards where all of our webinars are. And if you do have questions, please use the question and answer function um, at the bottom of the of the uh, app. So we'll move on to the let's see. So a little bit about Trusted Sec. If you're not familiar with us. Um, we're a full service information security consulting firm, and we pretty much do every, you know, in, information security consulting service you can imagine. We were founded in you know, a little over 10 years ago by David Kennedy. Um, we're up to almost 90 consultants, about 130 employees, almost 90 of those being consultants. And one of the neat things about us is we're completely product and vendor agnostic. So we do not, you know, when, when we work with people, we Really try to get them to utilize, you know, what tools they have and everything um, to the best of the abilities versus trying to tell you, hey, this is where you have issues. And these are, uh, you know, products that we can sell you to fix those issues. So ways we help businesses, uh, we have a design, you know, group, which is really our advisory group that does, you know, PCI program maturity assessments. Anytime you're trying to align to any sort of uh, framework. We have an evaluate group, which, you know, in that group is our testing division, which does penetration testing, red teaming, purple teaming. Um, you know, I'm not going to read through all those, you know, the services, but our hardening group, that's our remediation division. So whether it's Microsoft 365, any of the cloud platforms, just hardening the, uh, you know, the attack, trying to re minimize the, uh, the attack surface. And then our respond group is our incident response group. Um, so we do, you know, if you're dealing with a breach, we're there to, to help you out. And then also proactive ways to, you know, try to not have that breach with um, tabletop exercises and threat hunting and, and so on. So, so next slide. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Drew Kirkpatrick. And uh, Drew, you know, thanks again for doing this webinar today. Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you all for joining us uh... Uh, this afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, I'm here to demo uh, JS Tap. Now, this is a, a tool I've been working on for a little while and uh, uh, just presented at Wild West Hacking Fest, but wanted to be able to share it with a broader audience uh, than the folks who were at that conference. Uh, what this tool does is it provides uh, a generic JavaScript payload uh, to help red teamers attack web apps. Now, uh, I say red teamers and not pen testers because uh, application pen testers, when we're creating weaponized JavaScript payloads, those are typically custom payloads. We are targeting very specific functionality of our clients' applications so that we can demonstrate the you know, maximum potential impact of that attack. But developing those custom payloads is really quite easy in the context of a, of a pen test. Uh, but it's really not for the red team. So there's some differences there in how you would approach development of these payloads. And, and that's why I created some, some different tooling, but we'll get into those differences on a little bit of background. Um, so I am uh, a pen tester in our applications group, uh, which means uh, I spend my days reverse engineering mobile apps and sometimes desktop apps, and we pen test those, but certainly uh, a good chunk of the time of the team we're working on pen testing web applications. Very, very common engagement for us. That means that my colleagues and myself, we spend a lot of time working with JavaScript. It's very common in the web application space. Um, not only are we analyzing how developers have used it in their applications, yet we are writing a good deal of our own and you know, free to scripts that we inject into mobile applications or in the web application space, payloads like JSTAP, okay? Now, because I've been writing malicious JavaScript payloads for many, many years at this point, I, I'm kind of always on the hunt for uh, new evil things that I can do with it. <laughs> and uh, I have enjoyed sharing those, those techniques and discoveries you know, in talks and webinars, uh, blogs and such, uh, but certainly over with my colleagues who over the years have truly grown uh, to appreciate the never ending supply of stupid JavaScript party tricks. Now, <clears throat> Before we really dig into this, I, I want to make 
clear from the beginning that uh, the joy that I achieved from writing these uh, malicious payloads in JavaScript and kind of the creativity behind that, that process doesn't really reflect my thoughts on the programming language itself. Um, as someone who has spent most of their career working as a computer scientist, in my personal opinion, the JavaScript programming language is hot flaming garbage, but it is pervasive hot flaming garbage. So uh, we, we have to deal with it. But on the other side, as from an attacker's perspective, JavaScript in a web application is running in a really interesting place, right? Uh, from a foothold perspective, getting code to run in a user's browser is, is a pretty interesting spot to be attacking from. So it's worth, um, it's worth working with uh, as an attacker. So now for a little bit of background in an application pen test, right? First, of course, we're looking at breadth of coverage. We're looking to identify vulnerabilities, misconfigurations throughout the entirety of that application, of course. But a good pen test is also going to look to demonstrate depth of impact. And I don't mean severity ratings on individual findings. I mean the development of proof of concepts that draws upon the vulnerabilities and features and functionality that we've identified in that application and ties them together into a realistic attack chain, right? So that we can demonstrate to the client um, and so that they can understand, you know, given their current application security posture, what an attacker could and would do, and critically, what are the outcomes, the impact of those attacks? Now, in these proof of concepts in the web application space, it is very common for the last step in that attack chain to be the ability for us as attackers to introduce our own JavaScript into the application. I can assure you, we still see all classes of vulnerabilities in web apps, but we do pretty regularly find ways of sneaking in our, our own JavaScript in there. And uh, when you are talking about an authenticated application that has sensitive data and functions in it, like we see in enterprise environments, this can be a mortal combat fatality because we can often compromise uh, that data and those functions with just a couple lines of JavaScript. Now, I do know that a lot of pen testers for a vulnerability such as cross-site scripting, which allows attackers uh, to inject their own JavaScript, and that ends up running in the browser of a user. As a proof of concept, they will write JavaScript that pops open an alert box on the vulnerable page. Now, I personally am not a fan of this approach because while that does prove that JavaScript ran, it doesn't uh, demonstrate impact because no attacker is going to pop open an alert box. So, I, you know, I find that developers, um, even ones that write JavaScript, often have a hard time bridging the gap in their mind as to what an attacker would do with that same capability in their app. And, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's not their job to think like attackers, but as the offensive team, uh, that is our job. And I think we do a better job when we show our clients and the developers what attackers would actually be doing uh, with the current state of their you know, application security. Um, for an example uh, of, of a, you know, a, a weaponized payload uh, versus an alert box, I, I had a client a couple years ago. Um, let's say their app did um, product parts list. Okay, that's close enough for the example. And this was a multi-tenant application. So they had a number of clients using the same system. And these parts lists were very sensitive, confidential information for their clients. Uh, had to be uh, kept secret. There were a lot of competitors that used the system. And uh, I'm assessing this application. And on day one, it becomes very clear that the application is absolutely riddled with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities as, as if it was a design goal itself. It was, it was puzzling because the rest of the application was very well secured. It was very well written. This was a, definitely an, an anomaly. And I get the developers on the phone and the lead engineer states, oh, the cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, we, we know about those. We've seen them in prior pen test reports. It's a low priority for us. Now, I don't have access to these prior pen test reports. I have no idea what was in them. But if I had to guess, I put money on it, <laughs> I would say that those pen test reports probably listed it as a medium severity vulnerability. And the proof of concept was an alert box, right? I, I don't think this is a great means of communication for this vulnerability class. So what we did, our attack path was, was this. 
Now, anyone on the internet could sign up for an account in the system and you were rewarded with a little mini tenancy unto yourself. And you could start setting up a product and products had a lot of attributes in the system. And some of those fields had cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in them. Now I could only take that workflow so far before I had to submit my product for review. I could not select what services to apply to it until it had been reviewed. And when you submit that product, uh, another user of the system receives a notification that there's a product to review and approve. And unfortunately, that user was an admin. And when they click that notification, the product view comes up on their page and our JavaScript payload ran in their browser as them with an admin's session. And it proceeded to download the parts list of the other tendencies and exfiltrate them. So, I mean, this took maybe an hour to write. <laughs> these, are, these are not complicated payloads to write. Upon demonstrating this to the dev team, uh, they quickly realized these were not low severity vulnerabilities given the context of their application and their client's data in it and the attack path that you can get to it as an anon anonymous user from the internet. So uh, very quickly, they cleared the dev schedule. They did an absolutely phenomenal job of prioritizing and triaging these vulnerabilities. And I, I think once it had been communicated to them properly, they did an excellent job of cleaning this up, okay? So practical demonstrations are an important communication tool. And when you do these demonstrations to the dev team, it does sometimes make them a little nervous <laughs> to see a practical attack and what are the impacts of that. But for a brief period of time, you have their attention. And these demonstrations are often followed by very productive conversations where the dev team is truly engaged in understanding the security impact of their de design decisions, okay? As an application pen tester, in my opinion, those conversations are absolutely the best outcome of a pen test, okay? Much more so than my client playing whack-a-mole with findings in a report. They, they're gonna get the report anyways. Then they can whack-a-mole to their heart's content, but those conversations are golden. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, as an outside consultant, I find I often don't get the opportunity to have those conversations unless I show up to the table with a little bit of shock and awe, okay? But let's, let's step back and look at this, okay? Our ability to write these devastating payloads that grabs the crown jewels of the application and runs for the hills, this is a pen test. And we had a lot of help getting here, okay? First of all, my client has given me credentials to the application and usually at multiple user roles. And I've used them. I mapped out all the functionality of that app. I've studied how the different workflows of the different users intersect with each other, which means that by the time I find a way to inject my own JavaScript, I already know exactly the sequence of requests and responses that has to flow from the browser to the server and back and from what user role to achieve some malicious goal. You know, maybe I want to privilege escalate my account or add a new admin user that I control. My personal favorite is stealing data I don't have access to. <laughs> Whatever that thing is, I already know how to do it because it's right in front of me in my BERT proxy history, okay? Writing a couple lines of JavaScript to juggle that sequence of requests and responses is really easy. This is a very simple language. I also don't have to social engineer anyone for my canned demo, right? If I have this payload that if an admin user clicks this malicious link while they happen to be logged in, something terrible happens. For my demo, I play the role of victim. I log into my test admin account. And with the developers watching, I'm the one who clicks the link. And whatever page pops open where my payload runs, I leave it open long enough for the payload to finish. Now, although these tailored payloads are usually pretty quick. Now that's a lot of caveats and a lot of obstacles to practical exploitation. And we communicate that to the client because that is critical information. Of course, there's the impact of the attack we're demonstrating, but on the other side of the coin is the attack complexity. How advanced does the adversary need to be? You know, How much inside knowledge about the app do they need to write that payload? What user do they need to trick into running it when they're logged in? You know, while these are discussion points in our demo and they're elements that ratchet up attack complexity of finding in a report, 
for a pen test report. For the red team, these are very real obstacles, right? You know, and a can demo, I could talk past this. These are finer details, but the red team, these are real obstacles. Identifying a user who has the right user role is not a trivial issue. And catching them when they happen to be logged in to run the payload is, is also not a, a given. And of course, it could be a custom application and they may not know anything about it and have no way to write a weaponized payload to begin with. So that's why I wrote JSTAP. Uh, it, it kind of addresses the scenario that the red team's coming from, okay? You don't need the user to be logged in when they run the payload. As a matter of fact, we flip the script. It's better if they're not logged in when they run the payload. And because we're assuming no knowledge of the application itself, the JSTAP payload doesn't send any malicious requests to the application server because we don't know what to send. Instead, we have this payload running in the client side of this application and the user's browser. So that's what we attack. JSTAP instruments the client side very heavily. And I think when you see from in the demo what data we're able to extract for that instrumentation, its value to the red team should become clear. So <clears throat> before we jumped out of demo, I want to talk about the payload itself a little bit. Okay. Now there's two modes of operation to this payload. The first is trap mode. And this is kind of the original concept of the tooling. And this is the mode you would typically use as a cross-site scripting payload. When I was demoing this tool the past couple months with red teamers, uh, there was a strong desire for another use case. And that was as a post-exploitation implant. So that is implant mode. An example of that would be um, let's say the red team has popped a shell on the application server itself or the server hosting the JavaScript files for the application or whatever method they choose to use, they just take the JSTAP payload and they add it to the application directly. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of benefits to this approach. Um, one is now every user of the application is going to be running that payload. That is a lot of loot. The other benefit is if you pick the right place to add this payload, say a JavaScript file that is used throughout the application. Uh, no matter where the user is, they're gonna be running the payload. You're gonna have persistence of execution and you're gonna have coverage and insights into what they were doing. Some examples of perhaps the, the right JavaScript file, um, jQuery is commonly used throughout an application. Developers often have a main.js that they kind of throw all their custom JavaScript into. That's often included everywhere. It, it really depends on the app. Uh, if you're in a hurry, um, you could just add the JSTAP payload to every single JavaScript file of the application. That's really gross. Don't do that, but it's really effective. <laughs> um, so that's implant mode. When you're using JSTAP or really any other payload as a cross-site scripting payload, however, you cannot assume persistence of execution. As an example, um, let's say we have a web application that has a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability. That means uh, I, there's some page in the app that I can craft a malicious link to that page. And if I trick a user into opening that link, when that page opens in their browser, my JavaScript payload is going to run, which is great. But as an attacker, I don't control what page has this vulnerability. It may not be an interesting page at all to the user. And they may see it and close the browser tab or navigate somewhere else in the app. And when they do that, my payload is going to be deleted from memory. Now, if I have a tailored payload, that is probably fine. I probably need a quarter of a second to achieve my goal, but JSTAP needs to keep running or you won't get anything. You, you don't tap a phone line for a second because you won't get any actionable intel out of that. JSTAP is sent the same way. We need it to keep running. So in trap mode, JSTAP brings its persistence with it using a technique I call an iframe trap. This longer runtime is absolutely critical to making this technique work. So let's talk about this persistence technique a little bit. Um, for some background, an, an iframe, okay? This is a, a really old web programming technique and it's basically a browser in a browser, okay? If I'm a web developer, I'm laying out my web page, I can create a frame, iframe on that page and point that iframe at a URL as if it was its own browser tab. And if the page I'm trying to load into it allows it, 
it will show up in that iframe as if it's part of my page. Now, this is very commonly used for embedding maps, uh, third-party credit card payment forms, third-party support chats, all sorts of stuff. Now, the problem with iframing is that there's a class of vulnerabilities called clickjacking, okay? If I can iframe your application in my third-party site and there's some sensitive functionality in your app, I trick a user into visiting my, my web page, I can make that iframe of your application invisible. And if I get the user clicking things and dragging things around, playing a game perhaps to win a prize, what they don't realize is that they're actually executing actions in the invisible application, okay? A lot of things have to line up for these attacks. They're kind of clunky to code up, but they, they do work. Fortunately, the protection against clickjacking attacks is really quite easy. And that is, don't let your site be iframed. <laughs> uh, simple security headers will block this. Uh, content security policy is probably the best way of doing that today. Um, the problem with blocking iframing is that developers like to use iframes. So there is a happy compromise that we see all the time. And that is an iframing policy that allows it from same origin or self. That means that the application can frame itself, but no other domain can. So you're completely protected against click clickjacking attacks but developers can still use iframes in their app. So a very, very common setting. This policy or anything more lenient allows iframe traps to work. So let's say user has clicked our malicious link and the boring page they have no interest on being on opens up. The first thing JSTAP does in trap mode is create an iframe and sticks the user somewhere else in the application. Where that somewhere else is has to be configured ahead of time. In this screenshot, we have an iframe that is not full screen. Uh, JSTAP, of course, actually makes this the entire screen so you don't see the background. This pink page in the background is the actual vulnerable page, okay? And this is its location. So the user is now staring at this. And of course, if this was full screen, that's all they would see. The problem with this is now the address bar of the browser is wrong. It is showing the location of the vulnerable page not where the user thinks they are. So to solve that, JSTAP starts monitoring where the user is in the iframe and it spoofs the address bar, okay? Now our ability to spoof the address bar is not a vulnerability of any browser. This is intended functionality. While I cannot change the domain or the IP address here, I can make the path below it say anything I want. I can throw up emojis and the lyrics to never gonna give you up if I want to. And if you need that payload, it is on my GitHub. But in this case, we need to make the browser show the location of where the user thinks they are in the iframe chat, not the page they're really on. So with this iframe full screen, it's now a very compelling ruse. As the user navigates around, the browser looks normal, everything updates as they expect, but in reality, they never left the original page with the vulnerability. So the payload keeps running. So let's jump down to demo and see what this looks like. <clears throat> We're gonna start with WordPress. I've got my server running here. It spits out the creds here uh, when you start it up. And uh, we have a vulnerable plugin in this application. There is our terrifying alert box. And this is our vulnerable plugin with our reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability. And here's our alert box. We are going to replace that alert box with the JSTAP payload, which is served up from the server with telemlib.js. <clears throat> and right away, you see we are staring at the login portal for WordPress. And of course, you see this is the correct address of the portal, but in actuality, we are still on this page. Okay, so that's the ruse. Now, let's say, um, Let's say we sent a social engineering email to the admin of the server, supposedly from their boss, saying, hey, I need you to click this link, log in, make sure we're not running XYZ plugin. And hey, we have the new admin starting next week. Go ahead and create their new admin account so you can give them the, the password. They click the link. Everything looks fine. This is definitely our domain. All the rights place. So they go ahead and log in. 
And we can see we are at the uh, admin portal for WordPress. I'm sure a lot of you recognize this. Uh, now my boss asked me to check our plugins. We'll come over here and sure enough, uh, we've got a slightly outdated plugin here, but maybe not the one they were concerned with. Go back to the dashboard. And uh, they wanted us to add a new admin user. So we'll go over to users and we can see there's only one currently. That's the account I'm logged in as. And we will create our new admin user. We don't need this other stuff. We will make them an administrator. Now I wanna point out this password part. WordPress would let me set the password for this new account to anything I want, but by default, it will generate a strong random password like this. So we will um, we'll go with the secure default. We will pretend I wrote this down to give to the new admin and onboarding next week. And we will add our new user, okay? That should be enough to get us started. We will jump over to the JSTAP portal and we will log in. And we only have one client at the moment. You see them on the left, we can see the first time we saw this client was two minutes ago. The last update was 12 seconds ago. Uh, we get their IP address, OS, and browser. And we can add notes about this specific client. So if you had a lot of clients in here, you're kind of studying them, looking at them, determining you know, what user role they are, what any interesting things we discover, you could add them to the client-specific notes. We also have the ability to star these clients. If that's a really important one we want to keep tabs on, you can sort and filter this client list and show only the start items if you want. But you can also cancel their session. Okay, so when JSTAP first starts up, in addition to the trap mode and all the other things it establishes, it will reach out to the server for a unique identifier, which it uses as a ses session for that point on. If this client is providing me useless data or is filling my database with garbage, you can cancel their session and they will not be able to submit any more data, okay? If the um, if you're getting overwhelmed with clients, then maybe you've done an implant or the blue team has found your auth endpoint and is messing with you and filling you with clients, you can disable all new client sessions here um, just to kind of keep things nice and clean. <clears throat> but uh, we'll go ahead and select this client and on the right, you'll get a time series of events, okay? Now you'll often have a blank URL visit to begin with as things kind of get going. Uh, but here you see we have cookies, okay? So the JS tap payload is monitoring cookies, uh, local storage and session storage, okay? The first time it sees a value in one of these areas, it will report it in an event here. From that point on, JS tap's payload will monitor that value. And if it changes, you will receive an update of that new value. Now. WordPress uses cookies for authentication. There is a secret cookie value here that if we got it, we would be able to compromise this admin's account. Unfortunately, or fortunately, WordPress, like most modern web apps that use cookies for auth, has set the HTTP only flag on it, which tells the browser that JavaScript cannot read or write this cookie. So we will not be able to directly steal the admin session here, which is very sad. Uh, a lot of apps don't use cookies and they include some session token uh, through a header or the response body. We will get a copy of those. You'll see that in a little bit. Uh, now we see there the URL visited. Uh, this is not a surprise because the login page is what I set as the starting location of the iframe trap. And uh, we're also grabbing the HTML code uh, when they visit a page. So we can get a copy, we can get a quick glance, glimpse of the HTML code. Honestly, I prefer to download the code and look at it in my favorite text editor. You get nice color coding. I never got that working well inside the JS tab portal. Um, but then we get a screenshot, okay? So we can click on that, uh, get a blown up version, but this isn't surprising because we did force them into the uh, login portal. <clears throat> and the reason we want to catch them when they're not logged in is because we're scraping user inputs, okay? So we have actually, by forcing them into the login portal, we have scraped their credentials when they type them in, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and save these. This is certainly the kind of loot I wanna save. Admin account, I'm gonna clean this up. 
So we can save that for later, okay? Now, of course, the next, after they type this, the next thing we see is they visit the WordPress admin page. So it appears to have been a successful login. Uh, none of these cookies are gonna be terribly interesting, but we do see, of course, uh, the admin dashboard. Uh, so we can confirm they've su successfully logged in and we're getting good data. Now, um, you'll notice I have the entire page here in the screenshot, even though when I logged in playing the role of victim, I did not scroll down. So it is rendering all of the HTML into a canvas and then dumping that to an image. You, you might see more on your screenshot than the user actually saw. It's worth poking around. Uh, older versions of WordPress actually have log data here with IP addresses and usernames. So uh, you definitely poke around the screenshots. You never know what you'll find. <clears throat> and then we see the user has gone to the plugins page. Uh, we have the source code there and we can zoom in. We can get a, a obviously for WordPress, this is fairly trivial to enumerate externally, but now we have a good idea of what plugins and versions they're running. We can do a little research there. And then things start getting a little bit more interesting down here. They have visited the users page and we get a screenshot of the users list. Okay, now obviously this site, demo site has one user at the moment, but a, a real WordPress site, we may have get a number of usernames here uh, and we get their user roles. And then the next thing we see, they've gone to the user new page and we get a add new user form. It appears they're adding a new user to the system. I'm gonna pull this to the side because we're gonna go through this. And then we get a slew of inputs, okay? Let's put these side by side. We have a user login, that's the username. We see an email. So it appears this user was working their way down the form. And then all of a sudden, they're at the user's list again. And we go to the screenshot and sure enough, there's a new user, new admin, and they're an administrator. Well, that's certainly information I wanna store. But we don't have the password because our victim did not type it. Now let's look at this form here. In the password area, we see that there's a generate passwords button and a hide button. Now I know how WordPress works, but if this is a custom app and I saw that, it'd be pretty easy to infer that there was a password shown here to the user. And if the application could show that password to our user, it's in the web page, and we stole that source code. So if we go back to here and then scroll up to the user new page here, let's go take a look at this. I want to pull this source code over here. Uh, WordPress source code is, HTML code is kind of a mess, <clears throat> but let's make sure we're looking at the right thing, okay? Let's look for create a brand new user and add them to the site. Okay, this looks promising. We've got create a brand new user and add them to the site, matches that. Uh, there's a header, add new user, matches that. So we are looking at the right source code. Now, what we're interested in finding is what was here. And it is very close to this button. So if we search for a button with a label, generate password, that should put us in the ballpark. So let's go take a look. Okay, so here's our button with the label. And if we start hunting around, we get data password is this. And that is the password to our new admin user. So we will go swipe that. Back to JS tab. Okay, so we've now swiped the credentials of two admins. Um, now that does cover the bulk of what JS tab is able to collect. To pivot to the last part of the demo, I want to point out that uh, WordPress is not representative of a modern web app. Um, it's a CMS. Mm -hmm. It serves static content like blogs and web pages, and it's really good at that. But a lot of modern web apps are dynamic. Uh, they update in real time. What I see on the page can change without me refreshing the page or navigates, navigating somewhere else. Now, the way web apps are able to do that is with JavaScript. It's precisely why JavaScript was invented. In the background, 
uh, JavaScript code is making network connections. It's sending data up to the server. It's retrieving new data from the server. And when it needs to change what you see, it will rewrite the HTML code of what you're viewing while you're viewing it and change the display. That's credit where it's due. That's pretty slick. Now, the JavaScript language provides uh, two main APIs for making these network calls, okay? There is the older XML HTTP request API or XHR, it's a lot shorter, and the, uh, the newer fetch API, okay? Although lots of developers are using jQuery, very, very commonly used. It's a library you add that provides tons of nice JavaScript programming features and utilities, including networking. So we see that very commonly, but if you start digging under the hood of jQuery, its network implementation is just built upon the XHR API, okay? Now, the JavaScript language has an awful lot of quirks to it, um, but there's two in particular that are relevant to this next JSTAP feature set. Uh, the first is that these two networking APIs are presented to developers as if they're normal JavaScript objects, like any other developer-defined object. And the other quirk is that JavaScript supports uh, monkey patching, which means that JavaScript code can be rewritten at runtime by other JavaScript code, which puts us in the uh, not-so-great situation that something as trivial as a cross-site scripting payload can not only rewrite the client-side logic of your application, it can rewrite the networking stack underpinning it, uh, which isn't great. Um, but we can do that in JSTAP. Uh, so we're gonna switch apps real quick to, oops. This little toy app. Now, uh, I wrote this little app to develop this next feature set uh, for monkey patching. It implements three different ways of making network calls. Uh, there is the XH XHR request, which retrieves the answer 42, the fetch request, which uh, retrieves Vegemite, and the jQuery request, which grabs an old Monty Python quote. And there's a, a button to simulate an exploitation. It'll just inject the JSTAP payload. Before we do that, we need to make some configuration changes to the JSTAP payload. So we will go over here. Uh, the configurations are at the top in the init globals. Uh, we need to change the iframe trap start page. Okay, different app, different start page. This is the one we use for WordPress. Uh, this one is what we will use for this. Uh, this is a single page app, so there's really only one to choose from. So that's pretty easy. We're also gonna go down and enable monkey patch APIs. So with this turned on, when JSTAP starts up, in addition to setting the iframe trap, it will track down the XHR and fetch implementations and then modify them to add in the instrumentation. And we're gonna, for good measure, turn this on. So by default, JSTAP will grab a new screenshot when the path of the application changes. Now, this is a single page app, so the path never changes, which would lead us to just one screenshot for the entire data collection. When we turn this feature on, after an API call is made, this many milliseconds later, it'll grab a new screenshot, working under the theory that, hey, it retrieved new data from the server, maybe it changed what it's displaying. It's a little crude, but it's effective. So we will save this and we will go ahead and inject our payload. And you'll see the flash of the iframe trap taking over, but we can now make our, our requests. Uh, there's our XHR request. There's our fetch request and our jQuery request. Again, the app's still working. It's API calls still work, but if we go over to JSTAP, we now have a new client. We can click that. And we, we now see something new here. Now this API in this little toy app does use uh, an API key, okay? Um, that is sent by the JavaScript code making the network calls and it has to be stored somewhere. That is typically in local storage. Uh, so we will be able to scrape things like API keys. So I'm definitely gonna save this, my client notes. OK, 
Okay. And we have our HTML, but this is not terribly interesting. Um, very basic web page. And now we start getting our API events. Okay. There's a couple of things we're pulling out from our APIs. Okay. The when the targeted web application starts configuring a network call with an open or a config, uh, we're going to extract the endpoint that that communication is going to and the method. Okay. Uh, the method's typically going to be a get or a post, but it could be a lot of things. Uh, the URL shows us that this particular call is going to be sent to the XHR answer endpoint, which isn't terribly surprising. Uh, we're grabbing headers primarily because authorization tokens are very often sent as a header. So we have that same API key. We've now stolen it from storage, and we've also snagged it off the wire. And then, of course, there's the call itself, okay? When this has all been configured, the application is going to send that request across the network to the server, and that may have a request body to it. And hopefully, it gets a response back from the server with some body in the, the response. And we could tie those together, okay? So this is the API call viewer. You set the body of the request, and you have the body of the response. So we sent up to the XHR answer endpoint a request for an answer, and it sent back 42, of course. And if we scroll down to our slightly delayed screenshot, we see the page has been updated with the answer, 42. Uh, scrolling down, we see uh, now we have the fetch, OK? Now, the implementation of the fetch instrumentation and monkey patching is pretty different from that of XHR, but we're extracting basically the same data. So it could pre be presented the same way in JSTAP. Uh, so we have the setup. We have the endpoint and the method. So this is going to the fetch answer endpoint. Again, we see the content type header, which is a terribly interesting, but there is our auth token. And of course, we have our fetch call once it's sent across the network. Answer is once again sent, but we get back the definitely Vegemite. And our screenshot again shows the new data being displayed in the web page. And now we go down and we have one more XHR call. This one's a little bit more complicated. There's more stuff in it. If you look at this one, though, the endpoint it's going to is jQuery answer. This is us snagging jQuery network calls by instrumenting the APIs underneath it. Okay, um, jQuery sets quite a few additional headers beyond what I was setting, but you still get your auth header. Um, and if we scroll down, we get our call. And we see the answer came back with the Monty Python quote. And of course, our screenshot. So um, now that I have kind of gone through all my clients, I know this is just two, uh, kind of a just a simple demo. But once you've gone through your clients and kind of made the interesting notes client by client, you can um, view all your notes in one shot and export these as a text file uh, to kind of once you've kind of done your research into what you were able to hoover up and loot. Now, that's really all that's here in the first release here at JSTAP. Um, again, this really isn't something I'm going to use on a pen test. Um, I'm really going to go for those tailored custom payloads that demonstrate uh, more impact than just reconnaissance, um, you know, making changes in the application to affect some, some evil outcome that an attacker might be looking to do against the client's app. If I did have a client pushback, on my ability to write those payloads uh, because of my inside knowledge of having used the app, uh, I certainly would look at pulling out JSTAP or writing other some other more generic payload. I've been doing this a long time. I I could count on one hand the amount of times that has happened, and usually that person is shouted down by their own team. <laughs> um, so it, it, to this date, it really hasn't been much of an issue. Um, but in that case, I, I could pull out something like this. I, I do see this a little bit more as a red team kind of centric tool, even if it's not an everyday kind of tool for them. The, uh, attacking an app like this may be the second, third, fourth, fifth plan uh, for a red team, but I did feel that they should have some basic capability in this area. So that's kind of why I wrote the tool. So now uh, before I open it up to questions. Let me get the uh, slides going again. I want to point out um, to the pen testers out there, I, I have been 
harping on and pleading for more proof of concepts in pen tests. I think it is a tremendously valuable way of communicating uh, real impact to clients. A lot of proof of concept development in the web application space will often involve JavaScript in some way. You know, uh, cores vulnerabilities, file upload vulnerabilities, uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. There's just it's just a common thread. Um, it's not every proof of concept, but lots of them do need this. And I know a lot of pen testers are not comfortable writing payloads like this. So if you're interested in learning how to write weaponized JavaScript, we actually had a webinar uh, many years ago. Uh, this is up on the Trusted Sec YouTube channel. And this whole webinar is walking through the dev process of creating weaponized JavaScript payloads from the perspective of a pen tester. We're using Burp to develop that. We're using Burp to decode that with our inside knowledge from the pen test, okay? And the title of the webinar should give away how the incrementally developed payload ends up at the end of the, the hour or so. So if you are interested after watching that webinar, I have a free dev guide and workshop that matches that webinar, okay? The VM has the same vulnerable app, all the tools pre-configured, that development guide, and all the code snippets of those payloads. You, if you just want to copy and paste them over, you don't really want to write it, you just want to get an idea, that's fine. But um, hopefully that can help step you through some of the tricks of making these work. Um, please give it a shot. Give me a holler if you're having any problems. Um, I'd love to teach this stuff. Just you know, make sure you don't send me any of your client's data, please. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions about JSTAP or anything in general. Okay, Chris, I don't think we have any questions. Uh, do you want me to hand it back over to you? Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Drew. Great job. Um, and oh, and I, hold on. I actually, we did have one jump yeah, in here. Should, all right, perfect. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Peter, here is the, the repo for the tool right here. It's open source. So you can go grab it. Um, the instructions for installation are on the readme. Uh, thank you, Sean. <laughs> no comment. Sorry, I should have let that GIF, GitHub page up a little bit longer. All right, cool. Andrew, do you want to talk about, I know you have a blog coming out tomorrow too. Oh, that's right. Um, that. Yes. So if um, I have a blog covering this walkthrough, it's kind of a really good documentation of how to use this app and the features of it. Uh, I believe that's going to be posted tomorrow, Chris. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, again, give the tool a try. Uh, let me know if you have any questions or concerns. The um, That little toy monkey patch app that I was running is included in the repo. So it's very easy to spin that up and just play with it with that app. Uh, you don't even have to stand up another application if you don't want to. Um, have I ever used this like a phishing endpoint? Uh, Wade, personally, I have not. Again, I am a, a application pen tester. That's not the kind of work I do. Um, I, I have certainly done this browser under browser trick in unauthenticated pen tests where we found, say, cross-site scripting on the login portal, but we didn't have access to the application. And really, our only way of demonstrating potential impact is um, we, we actually scraped the login credentials. Now, again, I didn't target any real users. Again, it was a canned demo, um, but that was kind of, uh, I, I, that might've been a year ago where we did the iframe trap and then scraped the credentials off the login page. That was kind of, that engagement kind of kickstarted me thinking about this project uh, because I am usually doing authenticated uh, applications where I have much more knowledge about the app and could do much more tailored things. But uh, yeah, uh, phishing would be a really uh, good use of this um, kind of persistence technique. Um, let me see, would a WAF detect this? Yes, a lot of WAFs will detect um, cross-site scripting. Um, they probably would not detect the implant mode. Um, the WAF would mostly be looking for 
uh, user inputs coming in that look suspicious, right? If I was including, you know, in including a remote script, right? That's how the JS tab uh, was loaded in the example. It's a pretty large payload. Uh, so it would be tough to just fit it in to a single post, uh, but you might be able to do that. Honestly, the best way of blocking this is uh, one, don't have you know, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities <laughs> and keep the red team off your servers. Um, secondary to that is having, you know, if you're not using iframing, uh, don't allow iframing. You know, if really, now I know iframing is meant, the iframe restrictions is meant to protect against clickjacking. But if you're not using iframing and you block it entirely, it will also block the iframe trap, which is a very potent technique for keeping cross-site scripting payloads running. Uh, I, there's a couple of other persistence technique in the B framework. I haven't seen this one. This is a pretty powerful one um, that really can be, be kind of devastating <laughs> with how much you can do with uh, JavaScript on the in the client side. Um, and yet, uh, Peter, this is really more of a recon tool. If I was going to add more to the tool, um, there is one offensive thing that I know how to do that is generic. And I'm trying to keep this generic. And that is uh, proxying support. Uh, this is something I think B Framework has. I know Shadow Workers has it to some degree. What this would be is, um, so let's say I have JSTAP running in the user's browser. The feature would allow me to have a proxy running with my JSTAP server, and I, as an attacker, have a browser configured to proxy through it. Okay, JSTAP would route those requests through to the user's browser and out from their browser to the application with their session. Okay, so while I don't know enough about the application to write a JavaScript payload to execute actions, if I can just load the the application in my browser surfing as my victim, I could probably just point and click my way to whatever functionality I want, uh, upload server plugins and execute or whatever it is. Um, I, and the benefit is of course, the traffic is coming from their browser. So it's very well hidden from the server logs. It looks like they did it. It was their session came from their browser. I do have some code that does this. It is uh, not fully functional. It does work as a proof of concept, it would need a tremendous amount of work to get that really, really working. Um, it would be very interesting to add that capability to this tool because that would give you a much more direct offensive avenue, but is still generic. Um, but I have not had the time to implement that. That, that is a, quite a bit of work, even though I have a working proof of concept. Now, I say we don't know enough about the application to write those targeted payloads, but if the red team took these HTML files we're, we're scraping and handed them to their web app team, their web app team is probably gonna be able to write them those payloads. Like if you give me that um, that new user form HTML that we looked at in the demo, I could write you a JavaScript payload that adds in a new admin user, okay? Um, and a lot of application pen testers would, would be able to do that. So we're kind of stealing what we would need to write weaponized payloads as we go um, as part of that recon. But it is obviously early days of the tool, so not a lot of features. Let me see if there's any more. Oh, here we go. Could this tool be combined with beef? Um, I mean, certainly there could be cross-pollination of the uh, features. Um, I Honestly, I haven't used the beef framework in years and years and years. I did pull up his documentation last year to see if it was using iframe traps uh, as a persistence technique, and it's not. Because um, I, I kind of blogged about iframe traps about a year ago um, and then have been kind of refining the, the idea since then. Uh, but they're, as far as I know, they still haven't pulled that in. Um, I, I think, if I recall, I think it was generally a better persistence technique than what they have, but I'm not sure if beef is still in active development. Any other questions? Okay, Chris, I'll, I'll really be quiet now and hand it over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, cool. All right, well, perfect. Great, those were some great questions. Um, so that, that's all, we have nothing else here. So 
I'm sure most of you follow us on social media already, but if you don't, I highly recommend you follow us on Twitter, X, LinkedIn. You know, we have a lot more webinars coming out, as you saw in the early parts of the uh, webinar at the beginning. If you, if you joined a little bit earlier, we have one coming out for our new MP detection platform that we're going to be releasing here in November. Uh, the webinar is going to be at the end of November. As Drew said, he's got the blog coming out tomorrow. Um, lots more coming down the pike here shortly. So again, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate everybody joining. Replay will be on our YouTube page at some point, probably later today, if, if you want to go over it again. But have a great rest of your day, and uh, thanks again for listening in. Thank you, everyone.